eh, vamos a empezar, me toca a mi hoy presentar a André. Eh, antes una pequeña búsqueda de este eh, formato. Eh, va a ser el diseño original, voy a decir que yo voy a hacer la presentación en castellano, pero André la va a hacer en inglés, eh, porque su castellano no es no suficientemente bueno para dar la, la charla, pero que sí que vamos, entiende el tema castellano y habla castellano, pero igual lo voy una pregunta no hay problema en el que hagáis preguntas en castellano y bueno, el inglés de Andrés es perfecto y muy correcto y habla muy tranquilo pero ya te lo sigo en el mundo de Google Yo desarrollo una pregunta que es el Discompass que es un visualizador de perfiles políticos que lo que hace es, aparte en los periodos de elecciones lo que hace es un visualizador que tiene dos ejes en el eje horizontal es economía, es economía, es economía. Y entonces la parte de economía se divide, o sea, son cuatro cuadrantes, va de izquierda o sea, en economía, en la cuestión económica, la izquierda, o sea, la situación más de izquierda, si no se derecha, es la social más conservadora o más progresista. Entonces lo que hace el Discount Pass, eh, que es una herramienta web, lo que hace es mediante un formulario de 18 o 25 preguntas. Es brújula electoral. Brújula electoral. Es un brújula electoral. Entonces, lo que hace es, eh, mediante un formulario de 20 preguntas que eh, le la elección, y posiciona, te posiciona según tu ideología, que son esas preguntas, cuál es el programa electoral con el cual tú estás más cerca. ¿no? Y eso puede ir en, en la suma de todas las, las preguntas o en determinadas cuestiones. ¿no? En economía, en economía. Y bueno, eso es lo que hace. Todos los estudiantes Por un lado, el Discompass es eh, un elemento ¿no? es una, una empresa, un libro de investigación eh, vinculado a la universidad. Es decir, que es una empresa que tiene servicios, servicios fuera de la universidad, pero que viene de un grupo de investigación en el cual eh, lo que hace es práctica que aplica eh, viniendo de un entorno de investigación. Entonces, eso, bueno, eso es el contexto que estamos en la escuela que se entiende como muy bien esa relación que muchas veces tenemos eh, muy clara o se separa entre lo que es el general de conocimiento, la investigación y lo que es la práctica, la cosa práctica, ¿no? En este caso yo creo que es muy claro, muy directo y es un sentido como muy innovador. Y entonces, eso por un lado. Y luego por otro lado, lo que quería explicar, que a mí me parece muy importante, es la relación que tiene eh, su herramienta con, con el tema de redes redes sociales y todo con internet. O sea, es, una, es una herramienta web que tiene la única solución online y la solución eh, por un lado, por un lado, su educación y por otro, eh, claro, todos esos datos y estas impresiones de grupo y todas las cuestiones que han tomado aquí, de la que creo que se puede dar un día exclusivamente a través de lo que más ha hecho. Poco más que decir de André, de Seba y Gaston Paz, empezó casi como una especie de reto por parte de un periodista, creo, en el periodo. Y entonces a partir de ahí, a partir de esa especie de reto, desarrollando la herramienta, que se ha hecho una primera vez en, en Holanda. Y a partir de, de, de esa primera experiencia, Gaston Paz ha ido creciendo y eh, eso ha producido que eh, André y su grupo hayan vivido eh, todo el tema de primavera grande todos los procesos de transformación de la primavera árabe a tiempo real que ellos estaban viendo físicamente como investigadores como físicamente ¿no? entonces eso eh, lo ha convertido a la gente como un experto en el tema de la primavera árabe y la repercusión que o, o la réplica que está teniendo que ha tenido el tema de, la, de las revueltas ¿no? sociales llevadas a, a nuestro campo vinculadas a la, a la crisis económica el CM, el Tupido, el Strip y, y todo lo que está replicando, ¿no? Y esto me ha dado la vuelta. Ya está, con eso lo que hace con André, eh, el grupo Comi. Eh, ya está.
and, and, and over and over again, people go to back into, into, into office. So you share those characteristics with, I think, the, uh, the Mediterranean countries on the other side of the, of the water. Um, but you have also substantial differences. You have the possibility of a pro-democratic alternative coalition. I will talk to this a little bit more because it's a complex argumentation. So I'm going to give you some theory, and that's the facts, and then we'll come to the conclusion. You are also much better educated, much better skilled, and much better informed than uh, people across the world in Egypt, most of them at And what is good is that um, I think what is being formed now in Spain um, and across the Western world is a credible ideological alternative to the current situation, to the current regime, which I don't think is, um, is a pro-democratic alternative in the Middle East. I will tell you why I think the Islamists will rule that part of the world for quite a long time to come. So I'm going to be difficult because I'm a scientist, so we're going to go into some theoretical ideas, three theoretical approaches, but I'm going to keep it short because I'm going to be boring. It's Friday afternoon. I know. My students also are going to teach on Friday afternoon, and this is a lunch. Keep it light. But I do want to show that there is a reason why I'm telling you this. So, so, what is a, so what is going on in the Middle East? Is it a revolution or is it just an uprising? Is it just a protest? And is Spain undergoing a revolution or just some discontent of a small group of citizens? Well, if you look at what a revolution entails, what is a revolution? A revolution needs to be at least an effort, a concerted effort to transform the political institutions in a country. And also the justification for the authority of people in power. So do we have those two ingredients in Spain? Are the institutions being challenged? Are the justifications for the power holders being challenged? Um, these pressures for the change of the institutions need to be accompanied by some informal mass mobilization and also um, it needs to be an effort that undermines the current uh, power holders. And you could argue that, um, in that sense, um, the revolution in Spain is very imperfect, as it is, by the way, also in Egypt. So I would say that maybe Tunisia is undergoing a real revolution. I would say in Egypt and also in Spain, uh, you're not undergoing a revolution, you're undergoing some uprisings. Uh, but I don't think that the current power holders and current institutions are really challenged at the moment. But I don't think that um, uh, that, that necessarily is the end. I think there might be something uh, more destabilizing to come. And why do I think that? Um, I think that we have a democratic problem. A huge democratic problem in the West. And I say that because I study a lot of elections and I study a lot of public opinion data. And what you increasingly see is that people are losing their confidence in democracy. Now, it's very normal that certain people don't believe in democracy or in representative democracy. Intelligent people usually do not believe really in democracy because they can see through the system and it's very problematic to basically say, here is my personal sovereignty, my, my personal sovereignty, and I'm handing it off now for four years to some guy or a girl. But you will make more guys here. <laughs> um, bad guys, by the way. <laughs> um, um, there's a huge problem with that in a democracy. Um, because you have no clue what the person stands for. Most people don't even know what candidates stand for. They vote into a part of the tradition. Here it's even worse because you have Los Gos Españas. You have the dominance of two political parties that together get more than 90% of the votes. So clearly you have a problem with democratic democracy. Because you're going to hand over your power to a person that belongs to a huge, huge institution, a very powerful institution in your country, and is subject to much more pressures than your personal will of what should be done with the country. In fact, those other pressures from those political parties are much bigger 
then say your voice and your vote. They can manipulate you giving your vote next time around. And you try and vote another party in this country, a third party, what is the alternative, that's alternative. So people who are intelligent understand there's problems with democracy, but there's a deeper problem with democracy than just your political system. And I think um, that uh, those deeper problems should be analyzed, and that's what this lecture is about. Uh, and I'm now doubting what I should go into more serious. But let, let's let's move on because I'm talking too long. Okay, so how can we know what's wrong with democracy and why people protest? So I'm using three theories today, uh, through which I'm going to compare uh, the countries in the Middle East, especially Egypt and Tunisia with Spain. Okay, we're going to look at modernization theory. We're going to look at what is called modernization because we're talking about um, economic aspects that determine the level of democracy in the country. Um, and modernization theory also looks at some cultural elements. So we're going to talk about economic and cultural determinants of democracy in the country. The second is a structural theory of democracy. And that looks at the complex history by which democracy is formed. And basically the argument is that you cannot have democracies anymore. The, the, the idea is that there was a window of opportunity to become a democracy in the 19th century, a specific configuration of historical events that led to that state form of democracy, but countries that tried before and will try after will not be able to become full-fledged uh, uh, democracies. Uh, and that's because the class coalition necessary, and you hear the ring of Marxist theory there, the, the class coalition that's necessary to form democracy is no longer present. So we're going to talk about that. And now we're going to talk about the third, after modernization, structural expansions, is the transitional theory. So who is doing the transition? Who is mobilizing you to change the system? Who's mobilizing you? the revolution, the possible transformation towards democracy or something else. So let's first uh, uh, go to the economic requisites. Okay. Well, if you look at Spain compared to the um, other side of the Mediterranean, especially Egypt, you're looking very good. Uh, Spain has become, since the first time I was here, which was, I think, 81, I'll see for the first time. Uh, you become a very rich country. I remember Sicilia being ridden with poverty, people sitting in the streets. Really, you could see poverty around in the streets. Now you don't see that anymore as much as I did then. In 81, you really saw, um, I would say, um, uh, uh, the, the beginning of the new Spain. Uh, it was only a few years old. Um, uh, and has grown dramatically ever since. I think uh, uh, um, you might not all uh, be aware of that because you're not uh, But Spain has become a, a rich country very fast. And, but you have a huge problem, and that is uh, the structure of your labor market. Uh, I think it's partly due to the transition. After um, the Franco regime, there was a, uh, a negotiated uh, a change, and what happened was, of course, that with the new regime coming into power, they demanded certain rights for rights for rights for people. And one of the things they demanded, of course, was to get rid of the arbitrary state and to install political, social, and economic rights for people. And so the people who held jobs right after the transition got really good um, uh, social uh, and economic uh, rights, and some of them are really harshly reformed. The problem is, of course that you people are growing up in a globalized world where the buzzword is being flexible and competitive rather than having solidarity with the others. And so the whole, I would say, discourse around labor has changed from guaranteeing rights and, and being, um, having some sort of solidarity with co-workers has become a language of being competitive. You have to know five languages, get two educations and compete the people in the same mission that be better than that. And that completely, of course, undermines solidarity structures. And it's, I think, one of the reasons why the left 
doesn't have a discourse anymore. The left has lost the discourse, has gone along in the competition lingo, and has lost, I think, their ability to talk to you in a left-wing way. You will be, I think, submitted to what is generally seen as liberal, neoliberal language for the rest of your uh, uh, of your political uh, life. I don't see the, the left wing coming up with a new um, uh, rhetoric or even ideology, but we can talk about that later. Um, but uh, Spain is in deep trouble, particularly in terms of youth unemployment, particularly now in the fact that the European Union is demanding a specific type of austerity measures upon especially uh, southern European countries, which I think you should fight with all that. <laughs> But historically, we can show that austerity measures are really, really bad for the economy. Okay, okay. And the second one, please. Um, uh, but I think austerity measures will be the buzzword, and I think will be forced upon on you. So I think economically, same will be deep, uh, uh, deep trouble, but not as deep, of course, as countries in uh, in North Africa. And I'm going to talk about why these countries are much more trouble. And um, I think what's positive about Spain is that there is this highly educated youth. Yes, it's unemployed, but it will become, uh, uh, because you can no longer depend on the others to give you something, okay, you're going to be very creative. You're not going to just take it lying down. You're too intelligent and too creative to do that. So you're going to do things that we know now what you're going to do, but you're going to be the creative new class of next generation, and you're going to create a new economy, you're going to be part of that new economy, and, uh, and I'm very optimistic about that. Um, I'm not sure what it looks like, but I'm optimistic about that. What I'm not optimistic about that is the, um, is, say, the social structures that I see in Egypt. Because there people don't have the freedoms that you have to be created. They don't have the resources that you have to be created. Uh, they don't have the family capital that some of you might have to become creative. Um, um, so uh, I'm a little bit less optimistic that uh, there are a few examples in Tunisia in 2001. Um, uh, let me get the uh, uh, correct. 11% uh, of people who were highly educated were unemployed. In 2010, uh, that was 25%. So it doubled. Instead of, instead of people with higher education getting more jobs, it actually unemployment increased among the higher educated. So, so things are moving in the wrong direction in that sense. And so um, uh, uh, I think if you look at the two economic structures, then uh, <coughs> Both face the same problems, same structural problems, but I think there's a way out for Spain that there might not be so easy for uh, 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 for the Northern African uh, countries. And uh, the main difference is, is that why they can't come out is that there is no coalition that can force your politicians to do something else. I think here you do have that coalition. I think here. If you look at who's now protesting, um, uh, I think you will probably see an increase in the number of people who agree that something needs to be changed. Uh, if you do the socio sociology of who was protesting, I think it was by and large younger people protesting, although you saw increasingly young families. Uh, and what you then see, of course, is what the authorities do. They try to make things violent so that young families stay away. And if I were the regime that wants to stop protests, what you do is to make, you make sure that it looks violent, so that middle class people and people with children don't come anymore, so it doesn't look like a broad movement. And that's what I think was, was being tried here, to minimize uh, the protests. This is exactly what I saw also what they're trying to do in Tahrir Square. And let's have some violence that pretend that farmers are now invading the square, demanding security and demanding stability. But of course, it was all instigated by the regime. And I think also here, you don't think that just because you protest a few weekends uh, in an M15 tent and you sit there and listen to a few communists saying how bad it is, that things are going to change, okay? Because it's not. That is not going to give you the revolution. What you need to form the real revolution, of course, is to form a broad social policy, priority of the lower classes. So it's nice that you have such nice middle class lives, middle class education, but revolutions are formed by broad class coalitions. So what needs to be done is that to make uh, the, say, the discontent among the middle classes, the higher educated, with the discontent of the lower classes. If not, we'll get a little situation like we have in the Netherlands, where the lower classes are now being mobilized by right-wing authoritarianism, who basically reduce workers' rights. 
because we reduce the welfare state, because we reduce all the support systems that we have. Uh, instead of mobilizing them into a positive economic development of uh, political equality and social equality. And the thing is that we know through historical analysis that democracy is political and economic equality. That's what democracy is and that's what, that's what it is about. And so if you don't generate that, um, then um, uh, you have a problem. And this is not a Marxist talk. I'm not a Marxist at all. Um, uh, on the contrary, uh, I love capitalism, and you know why? Because capitalism created democracy. Well, I should say the contradiction of capitalism created democracy. You don't believe me? Fine. Read the book, I can accept it. Read the book by Rushmeyer, Stevens and Stevens, not to doubt, Rushmeyer, Stevens and Stevens, 1992, Capitalist Development and Democracy. Extensive historical research studying more than three continents and a lot of countries of history. And what they clearly show is that what capitalism does, free capitalism, what it does, it strengthens the pro democratic forces in the country and weakens the anti democratic forces. It's a complex argument that goes roughly like this. In a feudal system, only very, very few people control all the means of production. And they can oust everybody out of any economic asset that they have. Now, capitalism created a broad middle class of capital owners, of shop owners, uh, a broader middle class of people who service those people. And so what it created, it strengthened the class that forced democracy. Because once um, the broader middle classes had some economic rights, <laughs> they wanted some political rights. Because, they, well, you're going to tax me. Could I please? also have a say about how much you tax me and what you use for. And that's where the whole idea, and no representation, with, no taxation without representation comes from, this whole idea is of course that the slow history of particularly Western Europe has shown that there's a relationship between capitalist development, the slow capitalist development, modern capitalism, and the rise of, uh, and the rise of, uh, of democracy. And so, um, uh, <laughs> and so, um, uh, uh, this is not a Marxist talk because I think capitalism is necessary to form uh, democracy. But what seems to be lost is this connection between capitalism and democracy. It's what is called social capitalism. So capitalism should not be predatory capitalism. It should be uh, an economic development where a few people are able to steal all the wealth. Because that, of course, generates a negative spiral uh, against democracy. If a few people are able to take away all your assets constantly, the fruits of your labor, why would you work? Why would you start a job? Why would you start a company if somebody can take that away from you? The driver in capitalism is ego and your own wealth. And that can be a positive uh, incentive for people to get out of bed in the morning um, uh, uh, and actually do something other different than others. And so I'm not against competition, but what was the success of particularly Western Europe was the development of next to this capitalism a welfare state. A welfare state that said that some people who are economically successful would maybe not mind to hand over some of their wealth to help people who are less well off in order to prevent disease, to also give them education, to basically invest in the future of the country. And interestingly enough, middle classes were very interested in doing that. And why? Because it was in their self-interest. You have safer streets, you have better public transport, and transport in general, you have better um, universities. Because, you know, as a parent you can't buy a university yourself, but all parents together can buy a very good university. So there was a reason why people were going to what we call uh, social capitalism. It was in their own interest. So again, you see that um, um, uh, capitalism and democracy worked in each other's advantage. Now, by definition, the upper classes were against democracy. Why were they against democracy? Because it basically took their power away. 
Um, by the way, also, of course, churches were against democracy. Because churches were against democracy, especially the Catholic Church was against democracy, because they uh, were actually um, um, uh, they were actually losing their power to legislate. They were legislating marriage, they were legislating how you live. Uh, all the moral legislation came from church doctrine. When, of course, modern democracy uh, was installed, parliaments were doing that. And in parliaments, you have those horrible people like liberals and progressives and socialists and social democrats who didn't listen to the church anymore. So you can understand that the church is not very happy uh, uh, with uh, democracy, especially the Catholic uh, church. And you still see that in this country. And the Catholic church, I think, um, has intervened several times in your last election as well. And it's very interesting uh, that many people stay very calm when that happens. I think that uh, I would be very angry if the Pope tried to intervene in a Dutch uh, election. In fact, it would be a ridiculous idea. But Spanish people seem to think that is not strange at all when uh, the Pope speaks out on your uh, process in your classrooms or on your abortion laws. Spanish people accept that. I don't know why you expect a foreign power holder, he is the head of state of another country, to intervene in your elections. It's foreign intervention. And I don't understand why people accept that, but it, it, in Spain it's quite normal. Um, so I'm optimistic about Spain because I think you can form, with all of you, if you're clever enough, you can form this broad social coalition to change your country into a renewed democracy and social capitalism again. I'm optimistic about that and I think it will happen. Um, I don't think it will happen in the Middle East. Why? There is no broad coalition possible. If you look at the discontents there. It is the urban youth, unemployed, that is discontent. It's the intelligentsia, people at university, uh, and it's the bazaaris. Those are the people you see in the street, the vendors, the Middle Eastern middle class, uh, and the traders. Um, and the problem is that they don't share a common ideology. They don't share a common, a similar outlook in life. Now, I'm not saying that Los Los Espanos are not standing in the way of the North Coalition, because they are, and the two political parties are also standing in the way of a new renewed democracy. Uh, uh, but uh, not as bad as the class coalition that is forming in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Middle East and North Africa. Um, what you see there is that the youth tries to survive in the informal economic sector, the bazaar is in a sort of semi informal sector paying off the state to survive. Um, and you see that part of the youth is sort of adhering to democratic ideas. And you could see that that's why they call it the Twitter revolution. And people who don't know anything about the revolutions in those countries, the uprisings, they call it the Twitter revolution because they see this small part of the entire revolution. The young people are online and telling them that they want liberal democracy. But if you talk to the bazaars, they want liberal democracy. They have very, very conservative social views. They agree, by and large, with Islamic parties, and that there should be more Sharia law, that women do not have a single place in society, should not work, uh, should not even inherit the same as men, only half. So they're very generous. Women get half of what men get. Um, um, and so there is no social coalition um, uh, uh, that wants the same change. They won't change in a different direction. And that's why I'm, um, I'm very pessimistic about the possibility of a change there. And um, it gets even worse. Because I'm not sure, except for the Pope, which I think is ridiculous in the least, but let's say Vatican's, Vatican City doesn't have a large army. Okay? It's Swiss young guys. You know, I think there are a few thousand. So you don't have to fear anything. They're not going to invade Spain. So you just make your own laws. The Pope can't do shit. <laughs> now, that's not the same in Egypt. Their Pope is called the United States. And their Pope is a little bit bigger and stronger. And their Pope has a little bit more interest in guaranteeing their connection to the oil reserves that are present in that region. And you might not know this, 
Not everybody is an expert in international relations, but Egypt's the only country with one more country that's being forced to accept the existence of Israel with a lot of money. Okay? So what the Americans have done, they give around four billion every year in dollars. That's hard currency, always, <coughs> whatever happens. Four billion to the military to not fight. Yes. So what you yeah, it's interesting though. So you support the military to not fight. So what have the Americans done? They have actually subsidized the army of Egypt so much that they can't fight a war anymore. It's a very low secret in the Middle East. And why do you do that? Because Egypt is the largest Arab country. It's 80 million people. You don't want those guys to have a real army. Because they would wipe out Israel in a blink if they get organized. Because Israel is a few million, as you know. So it's like one to ten. So you only have to have good soldiers. You have to have only chosen a one tenth as good as an Israeli guy. And then you can wipe them. But the Americans are very adamant that there will be no strong army in the Middle East. And so they've started to interest the military into other things, like getting rich. Yes. And very strange, but most people succumb to the idea of being richer rather than proudly national. So they bought the military. And the military in Egypt are not interested in fighting good wars and protecting their own country, but they're very much interested in uh, uh, controlling the economy. There's rough estimates, uh, nobody knows exactly how much the military uh, control they get the four billion from the United States and it goes directly into their pockets and they do the things that they want to do with that. But they also control between four and thirty percent of the entire economy of the country. And the, the most logical thing of a military guy who is to retire early and go into uh, economics, to go into uh, jobs uh, in companies, controlling uh, and since they know people in the military, they can have contracts. So um, it's, a, it's a huge problem that um, uh, um, the foreign intervention in, the, in, in Egypt is so strong that it basically uh, makes the, uh, uh, the army an important, powerful player. And that's also why I'm so um, reluctant to say that everything will be okay in Egypt compared to Spain, because what happens in the Spanish case is that your former regime was totally legitimized. I think there might still be some fachas around that want the old regime back, but how many are there? Let's face it, there are not many that want Franco or Francism back. No. There might be a few, but no. Not really. Um, it's been discredited. I think Franco knew. I think that's why he re-legitimized the system the new system with the king. So he could conserve some of the conservatism with the king and not so just, and he knew that he couldn't continue after him. So he knew he had to re -de -legitimize, re legitimize the system. And I think that was a clever move. He seemed to accept this new regime relatively well for many times. It's things going bad now because there seems to be a problem with the next guy in line. So it's going to be a little rough ride to put the next one into place, but I think that institution might uh, survive. Um, uh, and there's no real urge to go back to the old regime, I think. So that's, that's positive for Spain. What's, that, that positive effect is not there. <laughs> Excluded. 
because otherwise they were afraid that Egypt might become actually run. Um, okay, so there's heavily military intervention in, the, in democracy, there's heavily intervention in the formation of, of the government. There's no, there's no way that there's going to be the opening that was here in Spain. The way that Franco handed over, or the Frankists handed over power to the Democrats, first to the UCD, to the parts of the regime, later to a full democracy, that didn't happen yet in, uh, in Egypt. And I'm not so sure it will. We'll have to see if they're just as, I would say, um, open to a, a democratic move as the Frankists were, but I, I doubt it very, uh, um, very sincerely. Uh, and why is that? Well, I told you before that how long do I still have? Because I, 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 this is I can do two lectures, uh, two hours, and so we go into the hours. So I, I told you if questions, please ask them. Uh, if you don't ask questions, I'm going to keep on continuing. It's, it's a threat. How long do I? Ten minutes. I'll try to make it a little shorter. So what I, I'm trying to say is that so there's a huge problem with the um, uh, with the structural elements, which is uh, uh, this foreign intervention supporting the military. Um, 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 but there is a cultural element to it as well. And let me let me highlight the cultural element. The cultural element is twofold in this country. It is the subservient and corrupt political culture of the people, and it's Islam. Now, the state in Egypt is all powerful. The state controlled by the military is very much intervening into the economy. The state is a repressive mechanism both of personal life of people and of political and economic life of people. Um, and so the access to political and economic means is very limited and dependent on the fact if you're a friend of the regime. Now, you will understand that that is not a very good, I would say, filter of who should have economic assets. Because it's not based on merit or ability or education, it's based on whom you know rather than what you can do. You recognize it already? You know, I do. I see it's in Spain too. You get jobs not because you have a good CV, but because you know people. I've been, you know, in the backseat of a few, uh, say, procedures of employing somebody, and people here write letters, do you know who my father is? <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you do? And this whole idea of, uh, it's rather whom you know than what you can do, is devastating for the economy. Okay, that needs to go. And the economy needs to be merit-based. People need to be judged on the basis of their abilities rather than of whom they know. They need to get into a door not because of the name, but because of their CVs and diplomas, uh, or even better, the track record that they have already in the job. Uh, and so, um, uh, you can see this whole subservient political and economic culture uh, existing in Spain, and you think it's bad because you've probably been either the victim of it, or you think it's good because you've actually benefited from it and are doing a very nice job. Um, 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 but they also know it's bad because you know that you didn't get there because of your abilities. So it can't be happy. You can't be happy sitting there and thinking, I got this job because I'm using it. I think that's also bad for your psyche, actually. So you should actually leave that job and move to the guy who can do better. But that's just Spain. Spain is bad, but it's not that bad. It's not as bad as it is in, uh, in authoritarian regimes. Corruption, if you look at corruption rates, Spain is bad. I mean, if you look at corruption rates in the world, Spain is looking really bad, okay? <laughs> uh, 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 in terms of Western countries, you know, it ranks very, uh, uh, very high on the list, but nowhere near Morocco, nowhere near Egypt. I mean, you are, you know, miles away from that thing. Okay? So, so uh, I'm not thinking about thank you. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, as my background is slipping through here for a second. Um, uh, and so, uh, um, uh, I, think, I think one of the things that uh, Spanish youth can easily break down is this mold of corruption around getting access to assets that you need to make your own life. 
And I think it's a very good political agenda. I think most people, most French people, even if they're on the right side, know it's bad for the country. But I think that's the track to go, and that's why to, to focus on and to fight for. Because I think it will dramatically change the country if you get a more merit-based rather than uh, a familiar-based uh, system. Um, um, uh, but the, the corruption in, 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 uh, in the Middle East is far bigger, and it's state-sponsored, and it's foreign-sponsored and supported in order to get political uh, achievements done. Um, and so what happened in the Middle East, especially in Egypt, is that there was only one force, one force that had the guts to resist it, because it had a very strong sense of identity and pride and conviction. And those were Islamists. Many of the Islamist leaders, ever since the 50s, have been, even since the 30s, have been killed by the military regimes in Egypt, particularly, across the Mediterranean. Islamists kept on fighting. Islamists kept on coming back, electing new leaders that spoke out of how bad the regime was, and they forced themselves into the regime. They forced themselves to be, to have some sort of electoral boards at university, at unions, and they showed that they were very capable um, managers of what they did. So the stupidity of the regime was, I think, is that they let Islamists in a little bit. And they turned out to be just like Christian Democrats in, in, in Western Europe, very able, very able people, very able administrators. Um, and so what happened was, everywhere where a Islamist was in power, or got something to say, he was less corrupt, not uncorrupt, but if you, less corrupt, or less likely to be corrupt, because you can't be a little bit corrupt, you're either corrupt or not. <laughs> so, so there were less Islamists that were corrupt than regime promoters. There were also better administrators, and they delivered the goods. If you see, for example, what the state does in terms of uh, housing, busing, uh, uh, hospital care, child care, and you look at what the Islamists do with foreign money, I think most people would bet their lives with a child on an Islamist assisted hospital than on a state hospital. And so what happened was is that the Islamists formed a sort of proto-welfare state, a secondary welfare state in Egypt, where you can get cheap housing, where you can get your child to school, where you can get education, where you can get pills if you're ill, so who do you think they trust? These people are with conviction, they deliver the goods, they defy the political system. And it's very interesting to me to see how they also safeguarded the revolution. The revolution? Let's think about this. I went into Tahrir Square the first time. I was there. I want to see this. So I go up to Tahrir Square. You have to cross a bridge to go to Tahrir Square from where I was. I was in Samalek, which is the island in the middle where all the embassies are. And Nice villas, imagine where I stayed, don't know. So I crossed that bridge, I was stopped by a guy at a gate. People all dressed similarly, I was stopped. I was like, okay, why do you stop me? And he said, so why are you? I'm a foreigner, I'm a Dutch European scientist, I want to look at your demonstration. He said, well, do you have a passport? And I was like, who is this guy? So I gave my driver's license, bring my passport cleverly, that was in the hotel. Um, I gave my, and they checked it, and they asked me a lot of questions, and then they let me through. And later I found out that I had just met the Muslim Brotherhood. Controlling who was in the square, controlling that everything was okay, that riots should be limited. Because this was their revolution. This was a concerted effort to show the regime that they had power. They occupied a physical space showing the regime that they can be challenged, showing the regime that they're not all powerful. They did it at the day of the police, which is the most hated institution on earth, because you think your policemen are corrupt? Think again, your policemen are heaven, <laughs> heaven compared to an Egyptian policeman, who gets paid very little, so at every moment that the policeman in Egypt has the time to arrest you, we will, and ask some money for you. There's no interest in bringing you to prison or to just not at all. Okay, this is income. Especially if you're like me. So, um, so the police are hated. So what they did, they challenged the regime. At police day, 
they took a public space, which was the central square of the city. And so space was used to show power. And so it was crucial for them to never give up that space. They could not believe in that space. That's why they fought tanks. That's why they keep on sending people. And so they already had gained legitimacy by challenging the regime. They now have gained legitimacy by holding on to the square. Because believe me, those other forces in that country, they could not have other than this kind of Nazis, don't let me laugh, okay? They're a funny bunch, they have fantastic ideas, I love them, and it's very good political talk, but they don't have an organization. The only ones with a political organization, credibility, and legitimacy are the Islamists. You asked people what would they vote for? 20% said Islamists. We go to an election, they get almost 50. In Tunisia and in Egypt, what do you think that is? I think we know why that is. They've got They've got the credibility. Together with the Salafists, which is a step more, um, I would say, uh, um, Opus Dei, it says Opus Dei. Um, um, uh, they got 70 percent. 70 percent of Egyptian people voted for Islamism. There is no alternative. There is no political, not liberalism, not social democracy, not Christian democracy, there's nothing else about Islamism in those countries. And so, I think, um, uh, that there's reasons to be optimistic about Spain. And many reasons to be optimistic about Spain. I, 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 although my Spanish is very limited, hence the English here, I do talk to a lot of Spanish people, and I see a lot of power coming from individuals and groups of people to try and change things and they will not take it lying down and they think the system should change and it will. I think in the end if you push a little harder it will be faster but things will change, it needs to change and there's positive external pressures um, uh, I think uh, uh, too, um, not so in Egypt. Uh, I think um, uh, that although you share some characteristics I think the pressures, especially the foreign pressures uh, but also the internal pressures on that country have resulted in the fact that there's only one legitimate new ruler uh, who are capable, well organized, and have strong legitimacy, and those are the Islamists. Uh, maybe in the question answer we can go into whether this means no democracy. Can Islam and democracy be connected? Can Islamists be democratic? That's an interesting question to ask. Can you have a full democracy when you think that women are worth half the men? Uh, is that possible? Do Catholics think the same, or is that different in Catholicism? Um, um, and so we we can talk about um, um, whether um, um, the old regime will actually give up their power, and here will you force the old regime to change into a new regime? Um, um, uh, I think that. Uh, um, my optimism for Spain is fed by the fact that I can talk to you directly, or at least a little bit. I can, let, I can do that to Egyptians, so I apologize uh, to Egyptians that might have talked to me and have made me more positive. Uh, I don't speak Arabic, so I'm depending on translators. Uh, so there might be a lot of people around that are far more uh, pushy than I have met, but I am less optimistic than the ones I've met have been very resignated. Uh, basically want to leave the country. Uh, I think it's not a goal, and this is something that you need to avoid. If you've got the elite and the future running away from your country, you can just about forget it, I think. Uh, then nothing will ever happen. And then I don't see about, uh, among Spanish, I think the MC, M16 movement showed that people want to change it here, and not just go uh, and live in the Netherlands, although I can recommend that very strongly. Uh, it's a very expensive place, it's a very nice city. Um, and don't come all the months, but you know what? Um, um, uh, but I, I think I didn't see that kind of drive that I saw among Spanish people to change the situation uh, unless they were in uh, Islamists uh, uh, in Egypt. Islamists have a very clear political agenda. They've taken over power. The only question is, will the military give it to them? Will the military give them the power that they actually earned in a reasonably fair election? Um, and I think that answer uh, will be given in the next few months, but you can speculate now in questions and answers. I thank you very much for your attention.
some clearly no elected uh, by the people. Um, there's no announcement of elections. So, um, that's it. We are taking our teacher, Egypt, in the same but when it is a strong enough of democracy, it seems like it is not a problem. I know it's quite far from the it's not I'm very well, interested. Actually, actually, it's quite quite close to the theme because uh, I can do that. I think they can understand. Yeah. No, but, but they have to yeah. record. My, my voice carries. No, but they have to record. Uh, okay. <laughs> so actually, it's quite close to the uh, to the theme because it's about external pressures. It's clear that Europe was, I think, a very positive force for the democratization of of the Iberian Peninsula. I think the collapse of the regimes in Spain and Portugal were aided by uh, European forces. Uh, you should read those interesting stories about the social democrats of uh, Germany going over the border with work, pockets full of money to set up the PSOA. And I'm sure that the right wing exactly did the same to build up political movements. The European Union pressured also Spain into with reforms. So I think that you could argue also with the structural programs that were given to Spain. I, I love your highways, by the way. Very well done. Uh, not all your politics are clearly corrupt because some of it was spent on public space. I think Europe was a force for the good, a force for democracy, a force for redistribution, a force for development. I am a little bit worried about recent events in Europe. So now the European Union is going to force non elected leaders of all two countries. In, in, because we have that in, you mentioned Italy, but we can also mention Greece. Yeah, but we have an election in, in Greece, and now, at least. You have an election that was in Greece, not in, not, not in Italy, Italy yet. True. True. So I'm, I'm as worried as you are about uh, basically the European Union forcing governments upon people until they basically deliver the, the policies that the European Union wants them to. Uh, and, and by the way, um, the guy, is, he, I think the, the Monty is even coming from uh, one of the big banks that has collapsed and, and uh, this goes from the European Union. So it's even, it's even scarier than that, I think. So that's not a good idea. So that's, Europe should do that, I think. Europe should say, we're a democratic community, so you elect, you elect your politicians that you want and they, throw, they put in place the policies that they want. That's democracy. And you should decide and not your Europe should decide. So that is usually problematic. And I think, Europe should stay away from this kind of behavior because I think it would undermine dramatically also the, the will of people to start voting. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, if non-elected dem 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 uh, uh, non governments put policies into place that then elected governments have to deal with after, it, it you're basically setting a political agenda. So that is completely wrong and they shouldn't do that. And I, I'm very afraid of Europe and switching from a pro-democratic force to an anti-democratic force. Uh, if that happens, I, I become less positive about it. So don't listen to that. Do your own thing, okay? You just elected the government. I'm not going to comment on anything about that. You should do it, elected it. Um, um, let it do what it needs to be do, and, and it will be, be sent away if it doesn't work. Or it will be punished in four years because you have one single party government, so it's going to hold for four years. Yeah, but then you're going to send it away if it doesn't, it's not good enough. So, I think Monk is a problem. Capable? Very capable. People have said, but what's the alternative? Who's coming back if you let free elections now? Well, if it's Berlusconi, coming, would you still be in favor of elections? <laughs> no, I want, to say, I want to know that. Would you be in? Okay, there's free elections. Berlusconi comes back. You're happy? No, I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing is that I'm very happy that Berlusconi is not in power, but it's not the way. He should go. I mean, Berlusconi should be away from, uh, from power because Italians won it, not because yeah. Frau Merkel won it.
Um, but just talking doesn't lead uh, uh, to a change of regime. You need to build new institutions, you need to build movements that can push the, 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 the new system, the new regime forward. And everything is not doing that. Unfortunately. And that's hugely problematic. Yeah, well, congratulations, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, this, uh, one of the, of the big things that comes across from your talk is that there's a big importance of countries nowadays because you're making, uh, you're comparing what happens in Egypt with what happens in Spain, for instance, and in the Netherlands and other places. Uh, this is a little, and also uh, in the interventions that you're doing are like you. So I, I imagine when you say you is that you mean that we are Spanish or something like this. I assume we're, whereas this is not uh, the actual fact. Uh, I mean, I'm Spanish, I have a, a Spanish nationality, but I'm sure here, I, I know here that many people from many different places. And in a way, this is uh, something important for me because one of the main things that came in M uh, M15 or whatever is the fact that nations are not uh, ruling that much and that there are other uh, spaces or other infrastructures or whatever, like markets for instance or financial institutions that are so far, somehow apart from any democratic control or any democratic account. Uh, and this, this is a very big thing because then it means that uh, the states, China, and the Netherlands, Egypt are in a similar, or their population are in a similar situation in which they have no way to find a democratic way to control and to take, uh, to make their opinion to be represented in those institutions. And I think that's a big thing to, to talk also about democracy because it means how can we actually talk of a democracy in a moment that there are things that are much bigger than any camera or any arena that we could somehow uh, recognize as democratic. And yeah, in my opinion, this is also important. I would like to know your opinion on this. It's a public lecture, because there's two, there's two things. The, what is the argument about the homogeneity of Spain and identity politics? And so you can, I was talking about countries indeed because uh, that's partly because I'm a political scientist and we study countries as a whole. And I know that uh, um, um, some people think there is no Spain. Um, um, I have to hear the sentence on the but almost every week. <laughs> so uh, I know that there is a huge problem. Um, and, uh, one time, I think it was the Moroccans who captured the Spanish little island view, and there was, there was sort of photos with uh, Spanish flags on it, and Oscar, who is my husband, he took the picture and put it on the Lucy flag on top of it. So, on the loop. So, so uh, I, uh, I'm aware of the, so the, the fragmentation of societies, and, and this is probably um, a huge problem, of course, in terms of. Uh, okay, where do you put where do you put the sovereignty of people? Uh, sorry, where do you transfer the sovereignty towards? And then we are even more trouble that we go there because what is happening is that there's a there's a disconnection between say your will and where you can transfer your 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 will to and give somebody the sovereign power to to the elected power to take your decisions. That's being disentangled uh, because I. I see increasingly in Europe that identities are becoming more regional. You see that in Spain, uh, there was always, it was always strong in Spain, but it's being reinforced, also institutionally. You see the separation of Belgium. You see, we see it in the Netherlands. Regional identities are becoming stronger and stronger. But at the same time, sovereignty is pulled towards the European level. So there's an increasing disconnect between your transfer of your will to what you would rather have, probably a, a regional or even local authority deciding on what you need. Uh, but, that, but the power is taken away to make decisions and it's pulled even above the, the national state. And that disconnect, that complete disconnect now between where policies are made and where they're supposed to be implemented based on what you 
think is solution problem. And, and I don't think the European Union is aware of what it's, what it's doing in that sense, of how it's siphoning off power of local. Um, because all this redistribution and giving money to local cows, it sounds fantastic, but they become dependent on the European Union rather than on the taxation of their citizens. And this is the, the biggest problem in the democracy. I think citizens should go back to this idea of no um, taxation without representation. And they should pay their taxes more locally or regionally so that they can actually hold those countries accountable. Because what happens is with national or even supranational levels is that they can then redistribute the way they want to without the control of those people. And that is, I think, what's, 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 uh, what's uh, leading to a same problem that have oil countries. And we become almost oil country. Because what oil countries say is that if you have oil, you're not dependent on your citizens. Because your, your revenues are external, you don't need to tax your citizens. So you don't care about your citizens. Because you don't need them. They don't bring money to your state. They don't finance your military. They don't finance your repressive mechanism. That's oil that does that. Oil can be extracted with foreign investment, with foreign companies. So, countries that have oil don't care about their citizens. It's the big curse of the Middle East. There will be no democracy. Do you know one country that has oil that's democratic? I challenge you. Um, uh, it's very difficult to find one. Uh, um, and when it is, it's, it's, it's probably called Norway and it was democratic before it had oil. Uh, well, before it, oil was important. Uh, um, uh, the other, um, um, the other element, even is even more interesting, is it's not about that power goes to higher um, governments. Power goes away from government. Power is actually displaced into financial institutions, banks, financial institutions. That I mean, who is this? Who, who are these organizations that say that Spain is worth AA plus or AA? Who, who are they? Those rating. Does anybody know who is in there? Do you know these people? So there's a guy, I bet it's a guy, sitting somewhere in an office saying Spain is now worth AA plus. And everybody in the finance sector is like pulling the money out of Spain. I have no clue who these guys are, these rating bureaus. But they're super important because next time, you know, what happens is my country really hands over money then to the European Union to buy out your banks. So this guy sits in my office deciding on where my government money is going. I want to, I want to, I want to elect those people. And I want, to, I want to look in the decision that they made about this AA or AA plus rating. And I can't. I can send my government away. But that's no use to me if my government's actions are determined by a guy sitting somewhere else not. So that is a huge problem is that we still think about democracy indeed, about democratic national states or regional states or local councils. So a referendum doesn't help, a different electoral system doesn't help. We need to democratize those people who actually really decide over where our taxation goes and what happens with our taxation. So we need to get control over money flows rather than over votes and how they're counted. I don't care how you count the vote. There's always something wrong with it. I know 20,000 electoral systems, and they all have problems, huge problems. Let's not go there. In the end, that doesn't matter so much. What really matters, what really matters, is if I hand over 53% of my salary, which I do, so I work for free until Wednesday afternoon. Okay. I want to know what happens with my money, and I want to control that. What happens with my money. And people should think in that way. And how do we do that? And that's the most important thing. Um, uh, and, uh, and that should be the, the agenda of, of, of M15, and it was there. In rudimentary elements, it was there. This was the criticism. <coughs> but there was no way on how to do that. I think, I think, you should have forced your government to nationalize all banks and nationalize all their assets. <laughs> that would be really popular. I think the left would still be in power if they'd done that. And it's in a basic program, by the way. It's still in the socialist program, all, uh, nationalizing all banks and insurance companies. So they could have done it, it was even programmatic, even if they voted for it, so. But they didn't. But then you would control that more. Uh, congrats. Um, I tried to do this, but. Okay, let's go. Um, do you think 
in uh, the city and municipalities are the first step to uh, take the institutions back to the people. I mean, from the square to the city and then to the state. Um, that's a, it's a good question. I'm doubting because what I also see is that because um, cities make these very, um, I would say, very simple decisions like, like who gets the contract to build this, who can, uh, who can uh, uh, access this institution, or you see that there's a lot of corruption, especially at this local level. And there's a lot of freedom for corruption because it's so directly getting money to specific companies or, or people. So you would say that it's the first thing to take back because you would stop a lot of the corruption, which is very local. I'm just not so sure you can easily, easily do that. And whether or not the rule would be to basically change the system from, from the top. I'm not so sure how you can, if you can change it from below. But it's, it, 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 if that is possible, if there would be a few examples where people actually say they were going to oust, you know, clearly local corrupt, regimes and we're trying to replace it with something that is different and new. It could lead us itself, but I'm just not sure how you do that in a centralized system. Um, you know, with deeply entrenched voter uh, 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 voter distributions uh, over two parties. I don't think you can oust the peso and and the PP. And let's face it, they're both part of the problem. That's the whole that's the whole sadness of Spain. Is that you know which side of Los Dos España Juro? Los Dos España Juro. They are one one system. And and um, I just wrote a book about the party competition in 15 countries. And interestingly, although there's this cultural clash in Spain, and everybody talks about Los Dos Españas and how far they are apart culturally, it's the only country in Europe where parties actually approach each other in program dramatically over longer periods of time, and differences between parties' policies have diminished. The only country of 15 that I studied. Um, and so, you know, democracy should also have a real alternative. Democracy is about offering alternatives to the people that they can really vote for. There is no alternative in this country. No alternative that can win a majority. The only way you can get that is getting one of the those aspirants to change and become a real alternative. Do you see the PSOE changing? A guy who's an election, they keep him as leader. I'm sorry if they didn't just lose an election, why don't you go away? You just lost the election. To a guy who actually lost two elections before, true. <laughs> Which isn't a good record. <laughs> you win one in three. You know, that's, not, that's not a strong guy. But, okay, he wins. But then should there not be something new? <coughs> And so parties don't, I don't think the best way in order that they sees the need for change. And I don't see inside the system a well-organized alternative. So can you create it? And can you create it by local takeovers? Maybe. It's how liberals started, forcing us into democracies. It's how Greens started to win local councils and started to make green policies. Can be done. It can be done. But you need to force a coalition, a majority coalition, a broad social coalition, to oust the current leaders. And if that's local or it's regional or national, I don't care. <laughs> but you need to do that somewhere. You need to change and start doing it somewhere. And somebody needs to write down that story mobilize on it, convince people that this is the alternative. And so, why are you not all just writing that story now? Because we need to have that. So that's your thought, that's your homework for next week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have that story, I'm going to correct it. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Eh, gracias por la 
por la intervención, pero lo que quiero es hacer una pregunta personal. Es, es una pregunta que yo creo que es muy importante eh, formular en este momento en voz alta y es ¿cómo te sitúas tú en todo, 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 todo este contexto? ¿Cómo te ves? He empezado a hacer una lista de posibilidades y la voy a leer. No sé si eres un analista político, si eres un contemporizador político, si eres un negociador, si eres un agitador político, si eres un revolucionario, si eres un creador político. Es una pregunta que me la hacía mientras recordaba toda una serie de preguntas que se hacía de Tom Breck en un momento de conflicto parecido al que estamos viviendo. Él reivindicaba mucho que el trabajo, que una de las partes esenciales del trabajo tenía que conducir a clarificar, a tomar posición, decía exactamente, a tomar posición y en ese sentido, esta idea de tomar posición era cómo establecer las relaciones entre lo que te pregunta ahora. ¿Qué, qué tratas de construir? ¿Un lenguaje? ¿Tratas de ser traductor de un lenguaje? ¿Tratas de construir una imagen? Etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. No sé si es una pregunta muy complicada para acabar, pero, eh, pero la quería hacer. So, so, I didn't get the second one, the first is analyst, the third is negotiator, the third, fourth is revolutionary, and the, the fifth is creator, but I get, didn't get the second one. Yeah. I'm not sure of two, because I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, certainly, I'm certainly one. I'm certainly number one, I'm, I'm an analyst because I, I'm paid to do that. And I think if your boss pays you to do that, you should do that. Or, or quit your job. So I do that because I'm paid by my university to analyze politics and I do that and I write books. I have some proof of that. It's, it's, it, it's a corrupt system, it's called peer review, as you know. So, so it's a corrupt system of, 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 uh, of scientists telling each other they're good enough to be published in a, in a, in a, in a journal. But it, so by that years, I'm an analyst. And the second one, you have to explain me over a beer. Okay? <laughs> uh, am I a negotiator? I'm also a negotiator in, in terms of between people to negotiating what? Between groups to do something? Uh, let me tell you that I was once a negotiator. I formed a government in the local country. The fifth city of the Netherlands once asked me to negotiate among the parts of coalition government. I formed a coalition government. But that's not what you mean. That you are, uh, I think, talking about if I will negotiate between ideas and people and trying to. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's part of teaching. My my um, my attitude towards teaching is what I call creating doubt. I think doubt is the source of all knowledge. As long as you believe something very strongly, you can't think. You stop thinking. So I like to always install in my students the fundamental idea of doubt, the fundamental attitude of doubt. Where am I wrong? I must be wrong. This can't be right. I think it's the, it's the most enormous source of creativity if you think you're always wrong because then you start to think about the alternatives and keep on thinking. So in that sense, I'm, a, I'm not sure if that's your negotiator, but then you'll have to give me another beer and explain it to <laughs> um, I, I I'm not a revolutionary. I've been in a lot of revolutions. The two important one is this Eastern European Revolution. I was a student when the, the Berlin Wall fell, and I immediately packed my bags and went to work in Eastern Europe because it was fascinating to be part of that transition. Um, but I'm not a revolutionary. I believe, and that's why I talk about institutionalization, I believe in institutionalization of change, in solid, well-organized parties and movements, that can lift up people to do things that they can't do on their own. Long-term political projects, I don't believe in violent overthrows, because what we know about violent revolution, that what comes after it is really nasty, really deadly and ghastly, and you don't want to live that period. What I would like to live in a period where we take our ideas, our better ideas than current power holders, and slowly put them into place, replacing the bad ideas with some good ideas. So I'm not revolutionary. Am I a creator? 
I created a website <laughs> that helps millions of people to find, uh, uh, to find uh, uh, which part is closest to them. I created uh, more than 17 jobs at the moment, and at one point even 150. So I'm a creator. It's done with political science. So I, I, I'm, I'm five. I think I'm three, and I'm one. For two, and for two, uh, uh, for two, you owe me a beer. Okay. Okay. I think it's all. We're going to close here. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Lodos. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Very proud of. Um... I like being here. Okay. I live here. <laughs> okay.